to introduce to you Professor Max Maurer uh, from the Swiss Federal Institute for Aquatic Science and, uh, and Technology, better known as uh, EWACH, located in, um, in Zurich. Um, we've been working together for a while, since 2012, I believe, um, when I first came to EWACH on micropollutants and, and removing micropollutants from wastewater, um, upgrading wastewater treatment plants in, 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 in Switzerland. Um, and Max was the uh, mastermind behind uh, a lot of the uh, wastewater treatment technologies that we uh, were investigating um, at that time. Max is here for the International Water Conference that we're organizing next week in, in, in uh, Crown Plaza in, in Kitchener. And uh, we're very happy that he has agreed to also give a water talk this week here in, um, in Waterloo. Some background information about Max. Um, he's the head of the Department of Urban Water Management at uh, EWACH, and he's a professor of urban water systems at ETH University for Science and Technology in Zurich, uh, where he's at the same time also the director of the Institute for Environmental Engineering in the Department of Civil and uh, Environmental Engineering. So Max worked a lot on water infrastructure management, on infrastructure transition management, and uh, modular decentralized urban water management. He has a background in chemical engineering and worked since 1992 at, uh, at EWACH in Zurich. Um, and he focuses particularly on biological and chemical processes in wastewater treatment and novel con concepts for urban water management. Um, he led a very uh, important uh, project, uh, uh, an award-winning transdisciplinary EWACH project from 2001 to 2007 called Novo Novaquatis. Um, uh, Novaquatis investigated the possibilities for urine source separation as a new element in wa wastewater management. The project goals were to improve water pollution control by reducing the input of in nutrients and micropollutants and to close nutrient cycles. The project developed a fundamental novel approach to urban water management and the legacy of which you can find uh, nowadays still um, in, when you visit uh, Erwach and their bathrooms. And if you ever get the chance to visit Erwach in the future, you must see their uh, washrooms and the toilets that they have installed there based on this um, award-winning project. His current research focuses on uh, guiding existing water infrastructure and the large-scale applicability of um, decentralized wastewater treatment systems. He is the co-author of the article on priorities for urban water management and water sustainability published with the Seba College last year in Science called Emerging Solutions to Water Challenges of an Urbanizing World. And the Seba College uh, Toba Larsen will kick on our conference next week, uh, uh, talking in particular about that uh, in terms of publication. Max is here uh, today to present his uh, work, his uh, ongoing work on the potential for digitalizing and optimizing urban drainage using sensor data and his efforts to build an urban water observatory uh, UWO in Switzerland. The title of his talk today is Data Instead of Concrete, question mark, exploring the potential of digitalization in urban drainage. Please give Professor Max Mara a big round. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, I'm, today I'm not here to talk about crazy stuff like urine cell separation or feces management or stuff like that. I'm going to go more into the technical aspects. And uh, before I'm going to kick off with the core of my, my presentation, I would like to tell a few words about where I'm coming from. And yes, I am coming from Switzerland, where a good part of the country is vertical. And just to get it out of the, the way here, uh, this is our uh, favorite pastime. It's Switzerland after all. But uh, I need to be careful here how to look down. I'm paid by the ETH, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, the universities at, in Switzerland. We have uh, about 30,000 students there. So for most American size, it's pretty small. Uh, it's a fairly old public institution with a very strong focus on research. And I think that's also part of the fun, why it's good to work there. We do not just teach, but also do a lot of research, and we are encouraged to do research. So there's ETH, and the second name that was uh, uh, that Roy was mentioning was EAVAG, and EAVAG is within the ETH domain, a pure research facility, and we have the luxury that we actually have one specific focus, so there's 500 people working on topic of water. Everybody has water somewhat in one of his projects, 
And so you work together with uh, aquatic chemists to fish ecologists and uh, obviously also uh, uh, social scientists and economists, which uh, then have to deal with water as well. Uh, as you can see, it's about 500 people, very strong also res uh, research and consultant driven, hardly any teaching. So I'm a little bit between the two worlds, ETH and this research facility. But this is kind of the core topic I would like to, to, to uh, talk about today. Can we come out of the Roman approach for urban water management? And it's maybe a little bit uh, provocative here to, to do that this way, but basically 2,000 years ago, the Romans had a good way to deal with urban hygiene, and we still do the same thing. We put big holes into the ground and uh, let them do their thing. We hardly manage them. We hardly operate them like something that we, would, uh, that we should control. And just to give you an impression, it's still very the same. I don't know whether you can really distinguish these two pictures. That's a modern cutaway that's underneath the street. What you can see here is a pipe, and then you know the, the drainage from the, from the houses and from the streets go in there. Very similar what the Romans already did. And even, many, uh, even the, the shape is very similar, sometimes round, but sometimes they are square. Not even material changed a lot. There may be a sting here for flint, but nevertheless, here's a Roman fistula made out of lead. That's one uh, pipe that they dug out in flint 2015, lead as well. And so that's a little bit the basic concept. And to compare that with a car, you know, you, you kind of buy a car a few years ago. You need to tell them where you want to go exactly and how much passenger you're going to have. And then they basically cover up your, your windshield with a big manhole cover and they tell you, please don't touch anything in your car. You're not supposed to steer because you don't know where you are anyway. You can look out the rear window and see where, you, uh, where you've been, but it's fairly small and not very relevant. You don't have any ideas uh, what the speed is. You don't know any, any ideas where you actually are. And uh, you're going to pick up some people on the way. They might be ejected from time to time if there's too much people in there. And yes, the car is going to break down every now, so and then, but don't worry, it's going to operate again in a few hours. That's basically the state we are in with urban water management. We build infrastructure for peak design. We put the slab, some, some type of safety factors on it, and then we run it until it doesn't function anymore and we need to rehabilitate it. That's pretty much it. On the other side, there's a lot of enabling technology coming up here around us, and I would just like to highlight a few of them. You know, we talk about sensors. There's, there's, the sensor development is incredible. Looking at your cell phone, there's dozens of sensors in there. They cost hardly anything. Here, the accelerometer that's typically built into a, uh, a cell phone, two, three US dollar, uh, hooked in and works just perfect. I don't know whether somebody saw that on Kickstarter, you know, a little device, handheld, 11 sensors built in, communicates with your cell phone, so it has a, has a Bluetooth communication and tells you, you know, what's happening around you. 150 bucks, quite amazing. Other components are data. Data, uh, um, big data, is something that's that's just cheaper and cheaper. You can see here, you know, if you order a hard disk nowadays, 10 terabyte, 500 bucks on the on the on the on, in the US. Or typically, you pay about five US dollar per terabyte a month. This, this is not a lot of money for a lot of data. The third component that's fairly important is trans, uh, the, the networks, the data transfer networks. I just picked here one example from, from, um, <clears throat> uh, from Canada. I have no clue what the 11X is, but uh, I'm assuming that you guys know that build up. Uh, uh, data transfer network, Internet of Things to basically connect everything with everybody and everything. And that's happening independent of urban water management, the needs we're going to have. And the question here is now, does this actually help us to bring urban water management into the 21st century? And that's kind of the core question I would like to pose here, discuss a little bit, and uh, hopefully to get some input then from you out. Four examples I brought along. One is the Urban Water Observatory that we're building up that monitors entire catchment. 
And then one example, what are we actually doing with this data? What, what can you learn from this data? Then in a, uh, two other examples where we're looking at the, the wastewater system in more detail, trying to see what's actually going on in a, uh, in a more dynamic way. Let's start with Urban Water Observatory. That's also kind of in the title, and that's um, um, why I got invited. So I put most of my uh, time in this observatory. For the people who are not very used to or don't deal with urban water management on a daily basis, urban drainage is a highly dynamic process. It's dynamic in times of time, as a temporal resolution is extremely important, but also in times of, of spatial resolution. And here I brought two examples. One of them is we have this tiny area, one by two kilometers. Um, remember, it's a vertical country. Things change kind of fast. But one by two kilometers, we had put in there five rain gauges. And what we measure here is just different events. These are seven events. And we here kind of uh, plotted the rain sum for the different rain gauges. And you can see the minimal had here, for example, for this event, 31 millimeter. And the other one recorded. 45 millimeter, 50% difference within a very, very small catchment. You also can see that with rain intensities, and rain is the major driving input into the whole urban drainage system. And so you have this really strong heterogeneity within a catchment area. The second thing, the second example, so the case, uh, case study area that we're actually looking at, there's about uh, 6,500 inhabitants. When I look at them, it, within 10 minutes, they produce about 8,000 liters of wastewater. But the urban drainage system is, is, is designed to deal with about 7,500 cubic meter in these 10 minutes. That's the peak rain our systems are designed. You also can see here the, the uh, probability how often this rain is going to handle. So 0.2 or the, the return period of about five years. And you can see here the difference is a factor of 1,000. This is what we have to deal with in terms of dynamics and in terms of uh, variability that we have in our system. And so the question we pose to our urban water observatory is, can we monitor an urban drainage system uh, catchment in a high resolution? And I'm talking high resolution spatially, but also temporal. Then in a kind of a hostile technical environment. If anybody has been in a, in a sewer system, it's wet, it's damp, it's stinky, it might explode. It's just not a fun area to be in, even for technology. Uh, it's supposed to be affordable, scalable, so that you actually also can apply it not just in 6,500, but in, in 65,000 or 650,000 uh, population catchment area. And then uh, the last point is maybe a little esoteric, but it should be able to produce redundant data. I can tell you urban water managers are used to scarce data. They know how to fill up the gaps, but if they get the redundant data, they're completely overwhelmed. And being able to deal with redundant data, know what, what kind of information there is, is kind of something that's fairly important. And so that's our catchment area that, uh, uh, that we're working in. It's called Feraltdorf, tiny little thing, but it's close by and it has a few very, very uh, uh, good characteristics. It's about 6,500 inhabitants, so it, we still can manage it. Um, it is about three by three kilometers. That's the, that's the area. And for the, the people that deal with that issue, it's about 150 hectares of, uh, of, of sealed area that we drain. It's a combined sewer system. It's very typical for, for Switzerland and a good part of Europe. And has six combined sewer flows. These are openings in the urban drainage system where combined water and wastewater is ejected into the, the surface water if there is too much rain and uh, in the system. And so these are the CSOs. They have a considerable impact on the surface water. This is a tiny little river. And we do know that we can measure this impact on the surface water. So it's relevant what's happening there in terms of urban drainage. Not quite intuitively, but the whole water flows like that. Second thing I think I need to explain a little bit is kind of uh, LoRaWAN or the standard that the transfer standard that we use. The idea is we have here a whole bunch of sensors and we would like to have some kind of transfer uh, data network that connects with a gateway. The gateway then communicates over the internet with some kind of uh, um, uh, platform that where the data is hosted and then it gets pushed to our application server 
where all the magic and all the science and all the situation can happen. And what we decided on was to use LoRaWAN as a specific standard that, uh, that was uh, available in 2015. Never forget, you need to use what you have available. But LoRaWAN has a few specific uh, characteristics that are very interesting. One of them is it's highly, highly scalable. So it's built actually for the Internet of Things in cities. And so there would be, uh, they would like to have you know, thousands, ten thousands of nodes connected to the system without breaking down. So that's something that uh, the system guarantees. Um, it's kind of uh, non proprietary so it's open source. You can uh, know what the standard transfer uh, protocols are. It's in a non-licensed band, uh, free. So that's, kind of, uh, that's very nice as well. It's a star, star type network topology. So you have one gateway that communicates with the sensors. Um, it's hopefully going to change. Uh, there's safety in, the, uh, uh, in mind when they build these networks. And globally, this is one of the standards that we hope is going to deploy all over the place. Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, obviously Canada, a whole bunch of countries that uh, will employ that for the Internet of Things within cities. It's not all hunky-dory. There's also a few disadvantages. One of them is, and that's a very important one, it's very limited in transfer capacity. It's the reason why it's so scalable up here. So it's limited in terms of bytes per minute, and, it's, and, and not kilobytes or anything along these lines. And again, this connector very strongly with that. You're only allowed to have a duty cycle, which is around 1% of the time. This is built into the LoRaWAN standard. So this is an inherent limitation of the standard. It's not technological limitation, but it's a, a limitation of the standard. And to put that all a little bit in perspective, where are we in terms of standard data transfer networks? And so uh, something you know is the cell phone network, whatever it's called, GSM or 3G or 4G or whatever. It is it's designed to have long range, and it, but it's designed also to consume quite a bit of battery and have high transfer rates, data transfer rates. Similar, uh, uh, so the Wi-Fi system, for example, also, high transfer systems, uh, short range, typically within your house, but with a very short battery lifespan or high energy consumption. And on the other hand, you have then protocols that are designed to have a low energy consumption, long battery lifespan. You can see here Zigbee Bluetooth. That's probably what you, what you know. Zigbee is now used, for example, within the house for the, uh, for the smart control of your appliances, whatever you're going to have. Bluetooth is probably well known. And uh, the LP1 or the LoRaWAN standard is actually in this corner. Low energy, long ranges. That's where we decided to go into because we would like to kind of cover entire catchment areas. Uh, you can see here a few of the, the key characteristics. I would just like to point out the, uh, the bottom here. You see a cell phone has about two watts, and the LoRaWAN standard, uh, the LoRaWAN nodes that you're going to have, they work somewhere around you know, 10 nanowatt is the lowest one uh, uh, we have, but somewhere in the milliwatt uh, area. That's, that's a big, of big relevance if you're going to start putting sensors somewhere into a sewer where you don't have any electricity connection and need to maintain that system. That's one of the important keywords or key things that you would have. And so that's the kind of the system that we built up. We did some measurements, realized that uh, uh, within the, the, uh, the city it would be beneficial. First, we just wanted to go with one, but then we built a second one because some of the, the nodes weren't very uh, accessible. So I have two gateways and a whole bunch of different sensor nodes that we right now have rolled out. And at the moment, we are in a second or in a, uh, actually in a, f a fourth phase rolling out a whole bunch of of uh, auto nodes as well. It's really nice. Once you have things established, uh, then it's fairly easy to, to put in new nodes. Basically, you just have to put the, the sensor into the ground, and then it connects to your gateway, and you can scale it fairly easy. What you can see here is kind of this is uh, the farthest away. To, uh, actually, we have one that's 12 kilometers away, but so for test purposes, um, we have here one that's 2.3 kilometers away. Uh, Two gateways, a whole bunch of sensors, mostly flow meters right now. Um, that's actually all I would like uh, to point out right now. That's the way how it looks like. 
So this is a, a gateway. It's kind of uh, on a, one is on a schoolhouse. It doesn't have electricity connection. So we put the solar motor, uh, module there, and that works pretty well. This the other side, the, the sensors. We have two types of sensor. One type of sensor is actually everything is within one box. And so this is a, a, a ultrasonic depth measurement sensor, a water level management sensor that we put right underneath the manhole cover. It measures then here depth down to the wastewater and has the radio part directly integrated in the whole thing. We also have the possibility to separate this. So we have here the sensor and then we have a cable that goes then to a point where there's better connection. But the important thing is, these are underground radio nodes. So they're underneath the manhole cover and getting out from there. One issue is if you have stuff above ground, that's really, really difficult within a city. People parking or snow plows or think of something, it's a pain in the neck and everything you can put underground is actually fairly safe. And so this is an important uh, thing that we have. Okay. I'm going to present you a few results. They're very fresh. Be, in, uh, be aware that this is just something that we are now starting up. It's rolling. We're getting first results in. And so please take everything with a grain of salt. But uh, much of the results are actually fairly positive and we're very happy what's coming in. And so this is kind of, we have about 100,000 hours of operating, divided from, in about nine nodes for 10 months and 26 nodes for about three months continuous running. Be aware that about 70% of the nodes are underground, so they have to get out kind of manhole cover or wherever they are. And we had a very diverse uh, climate around us. So we had rain from rain period, dry period to snow, pretty much everything. So we hope that this is kind of representative that there is. And so what you can see is this: every single of these dots is a, is a, is a node. We measured here how strong the signal is at the gateway. And then we identified the signal to noise ratio. And of course, the lower the signal to noise ratio is, the worse the signal is, the more uh, def uh, data defects you're going to have. You want to be up here in the corner on this area where you have lots of signal and a small amount of noise. One thing we looked at is what's happening if the weather changes. Rain, for example, has an impact on uh, radio waves. And so that's one thing we, uh, we try to analyze. Do we see an impact of rain and snow? And uh, the answer is yes, but it's not that dramatic. And so uh, what you can see here is we identified the nodes during rain weather and during dry weather. Here's kind of the box plot statistics that we got and have there. And what you can see here is that during dry and during wet, there is a little shift, but it's not very dramatic. The noise increases, uh, but we have hardly any change in signal strength. So quite I'm quite happy about that because it does rain about 20% of the time. It's good to know that it still works. The second thing we're looking at is kind of the quality of service. How much data that is sent out does actually get on our servers? The basic number here is 88% till now, so we lose about 12% of the data. This is something also to do with the protocol, the standard LoRaWAN protocol. The LoRaWAN protocol does not have this kind of you know, check and balance where they send out the data package and then ask for uh, confirmation that the data package is arrived. They wake up, they send the data package and then fall asleep again. This is one reason why they have so little, little uh, en energy consumption. And so for us, it was very interesting to see if they do that, how much of this data gets lost. What you can see here is, of course, it depends strongly where the node is. For example, here you see the, the, uh, uh, the data loss that you're going to have, or the quality of service to put it positively, right? How much data do we actually get? You can see, of course, nodes that are very close, they have a very high uh, uh, data or very low data loss. And then the farther away you go, the less you have. And the above ground, they're very reliable. And if you go uh, below ground, you can see that there is a strong decrease based on the distance that you're going to have from the gateway. And you also, but you also can see that uh, it's not always the case. There might also be some uh, nodes that are kind of in a, in a radio shadow, and they then follow these lines as well. And so basically, it depends where these are. And if you put them underground, then you might need a more, de a more dense network of gateways to communicate with these kinds of stuff. Third one, and this is something we're very excited about, uh, 
looking at energy consumption. And here's where, where things get, uh, get really fun. So we, we analyzed all the nodes that we had for the time period. Remember, it's nine, uh, three to, to nine months. And so when you analyze this data then and extrapolate it, then you get something between two and several years, depending on the battery you're going to have, depending on the, uh, uh, on the duty cycles and all this kind of things. And so what you can see here is clearly about, you know, for about, you need about 3,000 milliampere hours in order to run a sensor for a year, 3,000 milliampere hours is about what you have in a, in a typical cell phone. It's usually empty after a day. So that's what we can do. And this is very important because practitioners need to be able to kind of put them in and let them run. And costs, that's the last one I'm going to go here. So we identify costs. It's the first prototype. Um, we, for a sensor, it's about 477. You can see that the majority was going into the lower node. We cut that down in the second phase of the, uh, of the second uh, uh, generation of prototypes. And when you break that down then into annual cost, this is what's relevant for, for most people. You can see that, assuming they last about five years, that half of the cost is depreciation and the other half is maintenance, and I'm quite certain that we also can cut down on this part. Right now, there's lots of hand-holding that you're going to have. And so the, the, just the whole sum it up, and that's kind of you know, our happy message. It works. We didn't know that three years ago. We're kind of nervous uh, putting that up. But it has a whole bunch of benefits. It's nearly unlimited scale and scalable. It has a very high energy efficiency. That's what we've seen. It's, we have a reliable time synchronization. I did not show that, but for people who work with data, this is extremely important that you know which data are actually connected in time with each other. But it's only here for sparse signals, so you can't transfer you know, kilobytes or entire spectrum or stuff like that. It's bytes per minute type of thing. Right? Costs are reasonable, and uh, what we hope for is that these gateway systems data um, will be put up by different companies, public companies, private entities, so that the Internet of Things that you can plug in there and use their infrastructure to, to, to do that. And there's lots of room for improvements. For example, data loss. Uh, we're working on a system where you have uh, networked uh, LoRaWAN radios, so not just star type topologies, but the network topology and stuff like that. So it works. That's cool. For us, okay. Let's let's shift a little bit uh, the topic. Let's see what we can do with that stuff. One of them is using binary sensors, and I think I need to speed up a little bit. So we'll go a little faster, and you might need to ask questions then afterwards. But uh, the idea is here, kind of, can we also what kind of sensors do we need in order to learn something about our systems? And one of them we, we thought, let's go for very simple binary sensors. That can be installed in our infrastructure. For example, this is a combined sewer wall flow, meaning that there's actually water ejected if it rains too hard. And what these record is, yes, water is flowing or water is not flowing. That's about it. So water is going to be ejected into the environment or not. We have different types. These are kind of um, uh, accelerometer built in that kind of start moving when water flows over here. These are the more capacitive of the electric sensors that just measure that. Uh, uh, whether the conductivity is high or not. And we built them into this type of compartment, so we know binary sensor that says, okay, it's overflowing, it's not overflowing, and then we had a control measurement, the uh, uh, precise water level measurement within the thing. Then you can do some science. The core question was, uh, how can you use sensor data, so binary sensor information to tell you, yes, something happened, but you don't know how much happened. That's what I mean with sensor data to improve your model prediction. That's kind of the key thing. We, we do have models that model that, but somehow you need to calibrate them and the, the, the information, the data that you're going to use ca can be different. And so this is one approach that was done by, uh, uh, by Omar, the PhD student, looking on how can you calibrate that and do you learn something about that? And I wouldn't present that if he wasn't successful. Uh, maybe for the specialist on, uh, amongst you, you're going to have a model prediction that has a certain uh, uncertainty around that, and then you have the data that comes here. If you have very precise data, so for example, flow measurement, then you just need to go in there and look at the probability that your model fits the data, 
and then you optimize at the likelihood functions that uh, optimizes this probability that your uh, model fits the, the line. If you have sensor data, it's a little bit different because then you don't just go for the probability function, but you need to have to estimate the whole orange area. So you have here uh, uh, maximization of the probability that the, uh, the data is actually somewhere above this threshold of this binary information that you're going to have. And um, just believe me, uh, it was successful. It's a Bayesian approach that you're going to have. You have some guesses uh, a prior that you're going to have. And then using just the binary sensors, just the binary information that something happened, you can use that to improve your model. It's not perfect. What you can see here is kind of the, this gray line. It's the 50% uh, confidence interval we have for now the new estimation. And then you have a whole bunch of dots. These were the precise measurements. So it's not perfect, but it's a big step. There is information in it for very, very cheap data. The third one I would like to go into is, is flood censoring. And this is something that's, that's very dear to our hearts because this is one reason why we built this urban drainage system to prevent urban flooding. But these are very rare events distributed over the whole area. So typically, you know, every five to 10 years, there's somewhere uh, um, a, a little local flood that lasts for a few hours. But you know, then you have wastewater in your basement and very, very, very uh, uncomfortable but they're not very frequent events. And if you want to have models that predict that, you need to calibrate that with events that hardly ever occur. So that's, that's where the challenge is. And the idea was, instead of me talking about that, I just let uh, uh, play a little movie. And uh, somebody took my... And now we're going to go for low tech. Let's see where we can let that run. Otherwise, I need... I need to talk. On Swiss Army training grounds in Wangen an der Aare, some rather unusual research is carried out by scientists from AFOG. Using video cameras and sensors, the researchers document how a town is flooded due to intense rainfall. Joao Leitao, the project manager, is very excited about the project. This experience is really nice. It's a real life, almost close to real life experiment. It's unique in the world. We're going to run a set of experiments here, collecting loads of data. So it's uh, made for flood rescue, and it's very nice to have it. We have pipes, surface flow possibilities, and have loads of water in the reservoir from the spring. The final preparations are underway. Sandbags are being piled up. A bicycle has been parked and markings made, which will help the researchers later to assess the water levels on the video footage. The last cables are being connected for the sensors. The water arrives. The main difference between this and a real flood? This is not foul smelling wastewater, but clean spring water. The test did not go quite as planned. In a real life experiment like this one, we faced problems, several problems. One yesterday was with the leaves, three leaves, was uh, clogging our uh, flow gate, and then we have to manage a solution for that. The cameras record image after image, and the sensors are continuously measuring water depths and flow rates. We are collecting tons of data every five seconds, and then we're going to use these to uh, improve the model calibration, and that at the final stage we hope that these calibrated models can help um, uh, predicting floods and then save people's lives and people, people's uh, goods as well. Okay, so what, what you can see, or what, what the, the goal there is, is you have, for example, you have the, the bicycle that's standing in the water, with CCTV camera, you can identify what, the, what the, the, the level of the water is, and based on that, you can try to use public CCTV cameras, you can try to use public uh, uh, or, or uh, Twitter photos that people take when their, basement, when their basement is being flooded, stuff like that, and use this to calibrate these models. Again, use of alternative sensors, use of alternative information that's around. But the last example that I have prepared here is the sewer, sewer ball, it's a little bit uh, a different story. We just, uh, two weeks ago, we actually had a competition international for a new name, and the la latest one is Squid. 
uh, cool acronym. But the, the, the origin of that is that kind of we had one project that was questioning, so how much drugs are consumed in a city? And one easy way, or one good way to do that is you actually go to the wastewater treatment plant, you measure, take a wastewater sample, and then you measure the, the, the drugs you're interested in. It's not something you get very good sales data on it, but at, everybody goes in peace, and that stuff then arrives at the wastewater treatment plant. So there, where we can actually assess the quantity of cocaine, amphetamine, whatever there is uh, uh, consumed, and can check whether some kind of public uh, or some measures that you try to implement reduce that whether that has an impact on that or not. But in order to do that, you have measurements at the wastewater treatment plant and need to back calculate. And this back calculation is what we are worried about or what we are focusing about. And so we, we had one PhD, Anne Katrin here, taking the samples. I was looking at the processes in the sewer system. And I just want to give you one example. It depends, the, the degradation um, depends on the conditions you have here in cocaine, for example. The green line is under anaerobic conditions, so no oxygen. The purple lines are under aerobic conditions, and so the degradation rate is different based on the conditions. So it would be nice to know what actually, what kind of conditions do you have in your sewer system in order to do this type of back calculation. That's exactly what this whole squid system is all about. It measures the conditions in there, different to the urban water observatory. It's not you know, one place in time, but actually spatially along the thing. So you have the, the, uh, the sensor swimming with the water, measuring how the conditions change when it, it starts to kind of uh, shift downwards in our system. And the way how we do now the experiments, it's, it's really fresh. We just uh, got the, the first production batch back from these. Uh, we con instead of doing that ourselves, this measurement, we convinced the 17 of our partners to do that for us and come back with the notes. And then we see how it actually worked for uh, different people and in different countries with uh, different uh, ideas. And so that's kind of the question I, st I started up with. Can we escape the Roman approach? Can we go away from design, safety factors, putting it into the ground and let it run for the next 50 years towards a more controlled operation where we actually know what's going on, where we have an idea about the dynamics, where we calibrate the models based on the data that we're going to have? And the answer after all these slides, of course, I have no clue. This is still research, ongoing research, where we try to find out, are we capable of measuring? How much does it cost? What do we get out of it? And is there really a big improvement? But there's lots of other research going on as well, like you know, management of the, 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 the empty space that you're going to have. If it rains in one place, can you kind of then divert the water to another place where it's hardly but there's hardly any rain and you have still a lot of, of capacity available in order to prevent and minimize combined sewer flows and all these kind of questions. So that's, that's, it's, it's quite exciting. I showed you four examples that uh, hopefully convinced you that this is something worth doing. I showed you the urban water observatory that we have where we try to capture the data, the dynamics of, a, of an entire catchment, also looking at the possibilities we're going to have from a, from a sensoring point of view. Showed you the binary sensor, one option, one possibility uh, to, to work with different type of sensors and different type of information. Uh, that's kind of the key. <coughs> binary sensors are very cheap, and this is something we really can roll out, and probably going to last uh, now for several years. If you're going to have a UV, um, uh, kind of an ultrasonic sensor or something like that, they're a little bit more fickle. And so using different type of sensors, using different type of information, but still learning a lot from them, it's one of the key goals. Flood sensoring, rare events, how can we capture rare events? How can we use information and data from rare events to calibrate our models? It's the only way you can calibrate them. Or, you know, you can't really just flood a city and see what's happening there and then uh, do that. And the last one, so a sensor ball, basically something we just played around, which is really fun but still provides us with useful information that we could use in order to um, uh, answer questions that people have. One question, for example, came from Germany that said, we have a crystal meth front that's coming in from the east. Can you tell us where this crystal meth front is? And this is kind of the type of answers you can give, which cities switched over from cocaine to crystal meth, which is not exactly a fun thing to do. Conclusions. Uh, try to kind of condense it down to three major conclusions, and uh, maybe there's also something 
we can discuss about it. I think the first results, at least for me and for us, are very encouraging. I think it's fun to do. That's the one thing. That's the reason why I'm, why I'm doing this job. But it's also that we actually, I think we do learn something at a reasonable cost and we have very, a lot of interested uh, partners in practice that actually would profit from one or the other uh, developments we're going to do right now, even if we just did that now for basically a year or so. The second thing that I did not really discuss in detail that Roy mentioned a little bit, I think some of the technologies we're developing here right now in a very traditional uh, environment could be game changers. And one of the keywords I would throw out are decentralized systems or modular systems that don't really rely on networks heavily, but strongly on, for example, decentralized treatment plans. But you're only able and capable of running them if you actually can monitor them, otherwise they're kind of useless. And being able to do that opens up a world of about four and a half billion people that right now don't have access to fairly expensive networks. This is a real game changer in a very strongly urbanizing world. That's one hope we have uh, that this technology is actually able to, to fulfill. And then uh, the last point, and that's maybe something with, this, uh, with the stakeholders, it's a very important point, just having the technologies, uh, even showing that there's a lot of benefits doesn't mean that uh, the practice is very happy to pick them up. And the key word I have here is industry 4.0. I don't know whether anybody is familiar with that. But that's kind of where suddenly IT, technology, big data start changing the production environment of industries. And so they usually use to produce the gadget, sell them, develop a new, 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 um, uh, new generation and sell these. And now what, what starts with Industry 4.0 is that the, the feedback come, for, come in from the, from the gadgets out there live and if they're capable of actually managing that in a good way, they can change their, uh, their, their way how they do business quite, quite substantially. And this is the same problem with, with, uh, with our urban water management system. These are people who are used to you know, pour concrete and to go and clean from time to time, but they're not used to deal with data. They don't, they're not used to deal with dynamically with the information that come in. They're not used to do, deal with redundant data. And so this is something that, that requires quite some change in the way our organizations work, plan, and do their business. And these are the kind of the three points I would like to leave here in the room. If you have any questions, I think we have some time to answer that. And on the other hand, just shoot me an email and I can try to uh, hook you up with people or try to uh, answer them. Thank you very much. very much. We have time for questions. Anyone? One second. Thank you. Um, I was curious about the um, use of CCTV for flood sensing. I thought mm -hmm. that was a, a, an interesting idea. Uh, I was curious what uh, what kind of resolution do the CCTV cameras uh, need, or if you know yet, um, in order to actually be, be useful or effective for for any sort of model <laughs> calibration. Um, let me give you a long answer to this short question. <clears throat> the idea is not to use specific cameras, but to actually use what, what, what pictures you have available. So you're not going to put up a camera to monitor an area that floods every five years. It's just not going to happen, right? And so the idea is if it starts flooding, there might be a CCTV camera hanging around. You know, I don't, Canada is maybe not as, as bad as the UK, for example. The UK, that just, you know, everywhere CCTV camera. Using this camera information, and to extract information there, that's the idea. Other, other things are, if it does flood, somebody's standing there taking a picture and sending it to their friends and say, oh my god, isn't that crazy, right? And using this, this data, this information with different resolutions, different things, that's the goal of it. But these are not very precise information, right? Timestamps are off. Uh, the, 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 the level measurements, you, you know something is happening, you know, it started approximately then, and it stopped approximately then. For example, water flowing into the, the it was in Berlin, for example, flood there. You have a CCTV TV camera that says now water is flood, flooding into the, the, the subway, and now it stopped. And this is why this is so exciting. We 
that, that uh, you have this kind of binary type of information. You know maybe flows. If you have a video, you can maybe uh, estimate the flow that you're going to have and maybe estimate depth. But it's not the perfect information we engineers would like to have. And so the challenge is not what the resolution is. The challenge is, you know, if we have some type of semi-qualitative information, how do we calibrate our models? That's why this uh, this part is so. Uh, there's a connection between the two, and that's the reason why this is so so exciting for us. Long answer, short. Oh, that's, that's kind of the danger if you ask me a question. When you were evaluating uh, data loss, uh, was there any parsing or repositioning the data to look at when the data was lost? Uh, like, for instance, when you were getting into uh, not flood situations, but flow through CSOs, for example, the most critical information is not at low flow, it's at high flow. Yep. Uh, and there always is this inevitable uh, result we end up with when we're looking at data is that we always lose the critical data at high flows. Yep. Um, which is whether it's through kind of obstructions of bump sensors, et cetera. Had you looked at the data that way? I know it's just fresh off the press. Yeah, so. not systematically. So, but one one fear that you have that we also mm -hmm. have that's not the case. It's not the problem about the, the sensors itself, the radio notes. It's problems like there's a car parked right on top of our our uh, manhole, right, and then when it tries to uh, and, and when it drives away, it's, it's back on. So we know there's a whole bunch of random components in there. It's not a systematic one where, you know, if it's high water, then it starts to fail. Um, there's, there's something, but we did not analyze that in, in, in great detail. And we actually don't try to kind of analyze that. We try to avoid it. And one, we have um, at least one technology that we, we are uh, developing, and there's a second one we hope to be able to develop. The one is the mesh network system. So right now we have a star type topology where they communicate with a gateway. We have uh, a prototype now that's meshed, which means they communicate with their with their bodies around them. That makes the whole trans transmission uh, much, much more stable. That's one technology. The second one is uh, we try to figure out how we actually can adopt the, the standard so that we actually can have some kind of confirmation. So there's no reason why we can't store the data until we s we're sure that it actually arrived at the, at the server. The protocol doesn't allow that right now. We're, it's not bi bi -direct, uh, directional right now, but uh, we'll see how we can deal with that. So rather we try rather to avoid the, uh, having problems. Um, <clears throat> right now, we are paying for it. Basically, we're, we're, that's kind of an internal project. Uh, that's a whole bunch of uses that we're going to have for this, this uh, technology. One of them is to provide us research data. And so we just kind of fund that out of the, the, the basic research fund we have in order to build up the research data. And a whole bunch of other, other projects are profiting from it. I just didn't, didn't really show that, uh, uh, show that to you. But I think this picture kind of helps to, to, to analyze it. Um, you saw the data, the cost to, to run that. So it's about 175 Canadian dollars, something along these lines per node per year, right now in this prototype uh, thing. But actually, if you have sensors to build in uh, like this type, so this is everything is integrated here. You can see the antenna. This is the box. Uh, we talk about you know something that's about that big. It's underneath the uh, manhole cover. It's fairly cheap. You send one in, he's, he's, he's done that in an hour or something like that, uh, monitored, and then you need to calibrate it, and that's about it. So it's fairly cheap. This is a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more work. You need to craw uh, crawl in, but still, if you actually just can mount it there, right there close to the manual cover, really something that's not a big deal. So we're talking about tens of thousands of euros or dollars, but we're not talking about millions. It's really in order of magnitude of tens no, of thousands. No, 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 no. The I project would, that you're running in that. Depending on who, who's doing the, the work, uh, you saw it's about 350 bucks for, for the sensor node. 
and then you need to kind of have somebody who's, who's doing that. But it's, it's uh, as I said, in terms of hours, you also can do that yourself as an organization fairly easily. Do, do you collaborate with the uh, open source clients to, to, to monitor this, to optimize this? No, not yet. Uh, so what we have is we're building up the, the Urban Water Observatory. We, we work closely, uh, communicate with the stakeholders. They're looking at it. And we have now two types of, of interested parties. One type is the, the operators themselves, the, the whole bunch of very communicative operators that have huge networks that would like to know what's happening. On the other hand, we have uh, engineers that would like to offer that as a service because one of the key issues is that every 10 years, they need to kind of uh, make this assessment whether the urban drainage system is still okay or not. And this assessment is very often done with no data whatsoever. And in order to improve that, they actually would like to kind of offer a service that they're going to measure for a few months and uh, identify what's happening. And this is perfect for it, as I said, because you, uh, it, it's fairly easy to, to set up if there's the, uh, if, if our in, uh, telecom provider actually sets up the thing, then it's basically transmission of data is almost free. Then on the other hand, you still need to analyze the data, but that's what the engineering companies are, are paid for. Hi, I'm Dan Mathers. I'm uh, CEO of 11X. So. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, shout out. Um, yeah, just uh, we're Canada's uh, only national coast to coast LoRaWAN network operator. Uh, we're seeing a ton of traction in a lot of different water areas. For example, we're running a pilot here uh, with the region of Waterloo where we're monitoring all of the aquifers. We've got mm -hmm. 550 production and monitoring wells and they need to uh, monitor them for turbidity and you know water levels and temperature and stuff. Um, so a couple of questions. First of all, um, what other areas beyond the three that you've looked at are are you uh, looking at to look uh, next? And uh, are you finding that the availability of sensors is uh, is good, or are you finding that you're probably going to have to develop your own, like the uh, the sewer ball? And then the third thing is, I think Swisscom's uh, rolled out or is rolling out a, mm -hmm. a national LoRaWAN network in uh, Switzerland. Yep. Uh, right. Would you use them in the future, or will you still continue to build private networks for these? Um, three questions. Let's start with the second question. We have I know, first of all, we are a research facility, but I don't think so. Anybody of our partners really has, as one exception, but of our partners really have an interest to build up their own networks. And so if they can profit from something that's existing, and it's not just the gateways, but it's also kind of the, the, the landing, so the landing zone where the data goes from. And so they would just like to hook up their sensors and then pull the data from somewhere. And, and Swisscom is, for example, our provider. They do actually provide this service, but just not quite up to speed. So we're a little ahead of them. Um, and it will be much, quite competitive, for example, the city of Zurich, two providers that actually pro uh, are now providing or planning to provide lower bound services. I don't quite exactly know why, but they do that. And so my guess is with the competition also the kind of the, the, the quality of the service will, will increase. Um, sensors, we're not, so, the, the, the connection between LoRaWAN and the sensors is not very big. So these are, you no. Know, uh, um, this is an integrated system, but this one is something that you can buy off the shelf. The problem about these is you need to have a sensor that uh, really uses little, little energy. And so the connection between the LoRaWAN and the sensors is not very big. We're not in the business of developing any sensors. There's a huge amount of sensors out there. Just to be able then to connect them, that's one challenge, but that's not that big of a challenge. And having sensors, being able to buy sensors that have very low energy consumption, that's that's crucial. And I forgot the third question, I'm sorry about that. Well, the first question was really uh, related to uh, what next. Oh, what's what next? The application areas that you're uh, investigating. Yeah. So what's next is, is also for more dynamic uh, um, systems in actually on, on, on operating wastewater treatment plants. There we have a whole bunch of ideas what you could measure in order to, to, uh, to do that. And, and the idea is a little bit crazy because they already measure a lot, but I can tell you every single measurement point is extremely expensive because they bring electricity there, they measure there, then there's a data cable that goes back, and then it's, it's uh, hardwired into their, their uh, SCADA system, and every single data point is a pain in the neck. And the idea is there that you actually can roll out measurement uh, uh, scenarios where you go in there 
and then have high density and um, measurement scenarios where somebody goes in, puts a gateway up, uh, throws all the sensors that he has out there, and then disappears again so that we have a snapshot with high density, high frequency information in order to then uh, use the other data that's already available. To cover. That's, the, that's the only idea there. You can see we're working with a whole bunch of different sensoring ideas in the whole thing. So uh, LoRaWAN is not exactly at the very core of our you know, development, but it's an important technical component that we use. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Max. I, I propose we close here. So please uh, join me in giving Max another round of applause. Thank you very much. And um, uh, what remains is uh, to give, us, give Max our little gift, a uh, token of appreciation. Thank you very much for traveling all the way here to Waterloo from Zurich. Um, and um, please uh, join us again next week uh, on Monday when we have the RBC Distinguished Lecture in Crown Plaza. So not on campus, but in Crown Plaza in Kitchener, a hotel where we have the uh, International Water Conference. And it will be Quentin Grafton um, from Australian National University who will give the RBC Distinguished Lecture on Incentive Structures and Innovation in the Blue Economy. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much for coming.